Today's episode is an interview with one of the creators of Triangle Agency, a paranormal investigation RPG currently out on Kickstarter. This is going to be an episode where we talk about the game and the game's production, and then at the end of it, I have attached a little segment where I've thought of a few ways where I think the game can apply to Mage or can be used to improve a Mage game. Just wanted to state that that was the format before we got into it. And with that, on with the show. Hi, Mage fans. This is your host, Terry Robinson with Mage the Podcast. And joining me today is Sean Ireland, designer with Haunted Table Games on the new game now on Kickstarter entitled Triangle Agency. Sean has done a number of other projects and Sean is also suffering through the glory that has been the aftermath of the smoke from the Canadian wildfires. And as somebody who is his friendly neighbor to the south in Philadelphia, for one brief shining moment, we are bound together as a culture. Sean, how are you doing today? Uh, I'm doing really well. Thank you so much. I was blessedly able to stay inside for most of the the smokening. And so I only had a voyeur's view, much like the rest of the internet, for most of the worst of it. And I hope the communities that are being more directly affected by literally being on fire are able to get the uh, assistance they need and <laughs> able to recover in due course. But I have a, a yes. slight feeling that this may not be the last time that yeah. this occurs. Sadly. So Triangle Agency, a paranormal investigation TTRPG, or Titterpig as we call it amongst those in the know, seems to be another entry in what I will call the surreal paranormal investigation genre. What led you to make this game now? In a lot of ways, it's impossible to quantify what makes inspiration strike and when it strikes. But I would say that the most direct answer for me is that in my creative partnership with the lead designer, Caleb Zane Hewitt, also working on Triangle Agency, a lot of our work together on this has has bubbled up from casual conversations, things that we're both interested in, things that we aren't seeing anywhere else. I would say that a lot of that is also fueled by our respective careers as game masters for hire, and that sort of fueling a perpetual need for additional content. And so, you know, having even an, an unspoken sense of where there might be interesting landscapes to fill or content to mine ultimately has turned into a huge creative undertaking and the creation of this game. Uh, so is this the game you wanted to be able to run, but it didn't exist, so you had to make it? It is absolutely an example of that. Yeah. Awesome. So let's get into it then. What is Triangle Agency? And I'll break this into two parts. What kind of world does it take place in? How does it differ or not differ from ours? And what do you play in the game? Or what are some of the options for what you can play in the game? Sure. So for the first part of that question, Triangle Agency takes place in a novel and fantastic setting that we call reality. And it is meant to be a one-for-one -one modeling of the world that you and I live in, with all of its horrors and all of its delights, with the exception that there is a phenomenally powerful globe-spanning organization, a for-profit private organization called the Triangle Agency. And the Triangle Agency's entire modus operandi is to stabilize reality by stopping the incursion of anomalous forces are trying to invade our reality and introduce chaos. So in many ways, you can play as yourself, a fictional version of yourself that works for this agency and goes on missions in the theater of the mind to help further that mission. And in some ways, there is also a deeper story even than what I just spoke about that players and readers of the game will actually be able to unlock as they progress through the game. That's what I would say for the first part of your question. To the second part of your question, players in Triangle Agency, when you're building a character, we call them field agents, you select three components that create your character. And this is what we call the character arc system, A-R-C. The A stands for anomaly, which is the supernatural force that you are able to wield the idea. I know I, it's anomaly, even though I just mentioned that anomalies are sort of the air quotes bad guys. This anomaly is an entity that has fused with you as a person, and you are able to use its anomalous power to reshape reality in a specific way. For example, you might be a whisper class anomaly, which deals with the spoken word and the written word and manipulating language and also manipulating sound. Or you might be a manifold with the ability to reshape space 
and create shortcuts out of thin air or even redirect gravity. Another component is your reality, R in the arc, and that is sort of your character's personal life or where they come from, their background, the, the forces on them that are their status quo if this other fantastical and supernatural stuff isn't happening to them. It's the people in their lives, it's what they care about, and it you know, it might also have things to do with their upbringing. And the third part of the character arc system is our competency. That is your agency assigned role in the company. Examples of that might be intern, barista, public relations, research and development. Those are all titles that you're given by the agency. And those are in our system ways that we actually sort of mechanize role play. You get a set of criteria that either earn you commendations for performing certain role play benefits. For example, if you are an intern, anytime that you take blame for somebody else's mistake, you get a commendation from the agency. You also have a prime directive, which is a behavior that's sort of forbidden. And if you violate your prime directive, then you can earn demerits. An example of that being if you choose the class reception, then if you ever sit down, you are supposed to remain ever vigilant. So if you ever sit down, you receive one demerit. So one of the things that you mentioned is this agency. And did you say that it was for-profit? It is, yes, explicitly a for-profit institution. Mashing together two ideas that we see frequently within the uh, the paranormal investigation genre of you have something like the Ordo Veritatis from Esoterrorists, which is explicitly the good guys, probably had something to do with the Templars or something like that, or the Rosicrucians. And they have been essentially a background conspiracy trying to protect reality since time immemorial. Or you have an agency like Pentax from World of Darkness or Special projects division, which is explicitly making money off of this phenomenon. And they're usually the bad guys, the people you have to stop being like, oh, you can't use Ethereum for personal benefit. It'll destabilize the entire town or something like that. What is the nature of the agency or what is a high level view or some of its attributes that wouldn't spoil the game as it were? And why make that choice? To sort of get a clearer picture of the role in the agency in a typical person's life, in, again, the setting called reality. Imagine the sort of holding company that owns your favorite home goods store and your favorite meat supplier and your favorite airline, right? There's each of those brand names you might be familiar with could be a subsidiary of the Triangle Agency. You learn very quickly that the agency has an agenda that doesn't necessarily care at all about your personal well-being. There's Every agent has benefits that include a life insurance policy, which can revive you from the dead. And so those are things that are indeed nice to have, especially when you're out in the field taking on extremely deadly scenarios. But without treading into spoiler territory, there is publicly available material in our free demo that we've released on itch called the Triangle Agency Delta Test, which introduces two of the major perspectives in the game. There's the Triangle Agency, and then there's another voice that are, we hope, a player's introduction to the idea that these multiple narrators, one or both of them may not be reliable. And it's up to you as a player, as you play the game, to decide what's valuable to you, whose values you think you align most with, and what that means for your group and for your campaign. Uh, can you give me an example of a dissonance between those two voices that may come up and how a character could choose? Oh, certainly. So I'm going to label pretty broad spoiler warning atop yeah. this part of the conversation. So if you are a player for Triangle Agency and you want to sort of preserve the magic of experiencing it for the first time, I recommend, I'm not sure, not don't listen. Skip forward a minute or two. <laughs> Skip forward yeah. a minute or two. Yeah. I spoke about commendations and demerits earlier. Those are the things that the agency respectively, it rewards you for doing things it wants you to do and it punishes you for things it doesn't want you to do. Commendations are a currency in game, and the agency lets you know that you can use those to advance your character and to make yourself more powerful using the abilities that the agency provides you. And you can also use those to purchase our system's equivalent of magic items. They're called requisitions. They're things that are sort of processed by the agency's powers into items and you know goods so that you can use that have supernatural capabilities on their own. But the agency never mentions what will happen if you accrue too many demerits. It just says it's bad. It wags your finger at you. It says, don't do it. There's this second voice in the playtest materials that we've released already and ultimately in the larger game 
that says, Psst, hey, kid, if you rack up as many demerits as you can, I will let you become more powerful in a totally unique way. I'm going to let you copy from another unused playbook and add additional powers that you could never unlock if you just stick to the agency path. That, I would say, is sort of the, the biggest on a platter example for players. Uh, now, I don't know if this breaks everything, but mm -hmm. is the other voice right? Uh, so you mentioned if you accrue enough demerits, you can get this cool other thing. Is it the case that if that happens? Oh, yes, it is true. Neither of those people that I mentioned in that scenario are lying. Okay, got it. Uh, it one of the things that is very difficult in a game like this is to maintain that ambiguity and mm -hmm. to deal with the fact that at the end of the day, any claim that is made within the setting ideally will eventually modify or influence or be reflected in the mechanics. So if there is a separation between those two, the narrative kind of breaks. So I'm always curious to see what the actual interface is with those. I always wanted to see something that was like a magical realist game. Magical realism dwells in the ambiguity often of what is presented and the uninspectability of things, which is not something that you can have necessarily in a game. It's something that's trivial to have in a work of fiction. You can have it so that, yes, this person has an angel that lives in their tool shed that's been there for 70 years, but a curious player will want to investigate that, which is something that is trivial to prevent in a book. You just have none of your characters ever really uh, bring uh -huh. it up. So it is a, a tough place to be in when a character has the ability to poke it with a stick, unless there is a, a, a way to avoid that. But okay. Okay. Does the public know about the Triangle Agency, or is it just kind of this vague thing that is out there? The public would be familiar with the sort of various diverse holdings. You know, again, imagine the company that you got your couch from. You know, you might be able to name that, but you don't know who owns that company. So, like, I bet people who are, like, really wonks about the economy and securities futures and things like that would have triangle agency on their radar. But a key part of the setting is that the triangle agency has headquarters wherever you are playing. The reason that you haven't heard of it before is that it doesn't appear on any map, that the eye sort of slides off of it. Only people who have business there or have been there before know to look for it. So what is their uh, interest in combining kind of the two roles of for-profit and protect reality? The first answer is play to find out. And I feel a little obnoxious even saying that. But as I mentioned before, the agency processes these anomalies into requisitions. And there are things that you can buy from the company store, but those are also goods that then can be sold by any of their subsidiaries. You know, it might be a free source of jet fuel for them, for their airlines. Within the world, are they the only expressly known entity that has familiarity with these? Or is it there are crank researchers out there, there are government research programs, there are colleges and universities that investigate these things? Or are they somewhat unique in their ability to interface with these odd things? A key part of the agency's mandate to stabilize reality is to eliminate any and all loose ends, which is also a mechanic in the game. But a loose end is anybody who becomes aware of anomalous activity and the existence of anomalies. So if there were a researcher who observed some paranormal phenomena and tried to publish a paper or even spoke to too many people in person about it, they would probably end up on the agency's radar. Their brutally effective measures would probably be why nobody in your setting knows about the paranormal activities that are going on. Uh, the phrase brutally effective measures, this seems like something that can really set the tone for a game. Is it something where, and of course it's an RPG, so each table may choose to do so differently, but as kind of suggested by the material that ships with the game, is this something where you're going around killing people or you terrify people into silence or you just arrange for terrible lab accidents kind of where on the spectrum of visceral terrible response does it kind of land the real answer is that's for you and your table to decide i in no way endorse or glorify violence but a key feature of this idea that you're being given instructions even in the manual of how to play the game by a voice that has an agenda is sort of belied by that idea that if you read closely, you see that you are rewarded based on kind of two criteria. One, did you capture the anomaly? And two, did you prevent any loose ends? There is no additional criteria for like, did you kill anybody? Did you ruin any lives? Did you have any horrific knock-on effects? The people who have hired you and who, who you work for on paper don't care about that. 
And that is a commentary on the employer-employee relationship that a lot of people globally find themselves in, that you have to, that you're being pressured every day and in every way to either compromise your own morals or to shift your morals so that they align with the company's profit motive. But that's also for the players themselves to find out at the table as they're playing together. Like, do we want to do this? Is this who we are? Like, can I stomach this? Would my character do this? So it sounds like there's the balancing thing of killing someone may seem to be brutally effective, but it is often the case that using that to tie up a loose end creates additional loose ends when a loved one or family member or whatever or employer goes to investigate. And two, it does kind of talk about one thing that we have seen in games over time is, as you mentioned, kind of more games that are talking about and thinking about the person, corporation, or employee, employer-employee relationship. And you bring up something that I generally enjoy seeing. It is often not the case that a company or firm is explicitly malicious, merely that they are amoral or don't care, and that we are finally realizing that we can, for lack of a better term, take advantage of that. That quite simply, if the firm doesn't care, I get to put my morals and ethics into that place. And that is a avenue for me to be satisfying in a work setting, but also in a game setting. Setting, where, as you mentioned, you explicitly say that these are the criteria you are being rated on. If it's not in there, we quite simply don't care. And I think that is a powerful place. Within the game Mates the Ascension, there is an organization, the Technocracy, which is kind of the, the global conspiracy, as it were, in the game that is similarly trying to keep reality safe from anomalous events and so on. It's one of those things where people are like, this copied from this. I'm like, no, 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 no. The idea of a conspiracy to keep things safe. We have evidence for this going back at least 3,000 years. <laughs> it, kind of in the same way that one of my favorite things is in the archives of Limerie's M, there is a, a letter to Asher Banapal from his wife saying, I hear the lands you are conquering are cold. Please wear the scarf I made you. That the oldest literal correspondence we have is a spouse saying, please stay warm. I miss you. <laughs> but also at the same time, we have ancient Babylonian stories about how kids today don't want to learn anything and they just want to goof around. Unlike my generation, <laughs> you're like, okay, maybe, maybe some things haven't really changed. <laughs> <laughs> but also that that ancient what Sumerian or Babylonian diss track about the copper vendor uh, and Nasir, is, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think the boss move there is the fact that a Nasir collected them. Um, <laughs> and got powers. Um, uh, just for uh, reference, what Sean is referring to is the oldest written complaint that we have from about 1750 BCE is a person writing a letter to a copper merchant indicating that the copper ingots they received were of low quality, also that they mistreated the servant that they had sent. And we found this, cool beans, but later we found like a stack of them. This A. and Nasir fellow had like collected all of these complaints and was sitting upon them <laughs> and drawing power from them. <laughs> so when people refer to burying negative Yelp reviews in 1750, Nineveh, was, this was quite literal. But kind of to the point that you make, so you mentioned investigate anomaly. And the word anomaly has come up a bunch so far. What is an anomaly? How does it manifest and how do you interface with it? Sure. So from the top down, an anomaly is defined as a being from outside of our reality that enters because of chaos that is generated by human thought, by conflict, by passions. That chaos gives these anomalous forces energy to manifest in our world. And so in a very real way, they're fueled by and can sort of be shaped by powerful thoughts, powerful emotions, whether they're widely held, whether they're soft emotions held by a huge amount of people or powerful emotions by just one or a small group of people. An example in the playtest materials is a anomaly that manifests at a school because the school, because this high pressure private school has the motto, shoot for the moon, and even if you fail, you'll land among the stars. This anomaly is it manifests from all of these parents and all of these kids focusing on high achievement, and it ends up taking that motto very literally. In the example that we outline in the book, this anomaly manifests inside the school mascot costume and becomes this powerful being that starts flinging unwitting people up so that they can be among the stars, shooting them at the moon. So Sentient can... lunar cannon. Yeah, which is an example, A, of a horrifying outcome that you need to use your powers to prevent these people from being yeeted into space. But also, B, it opens up some 
there, there are a few different paths that you can take when you try to adjust that. When you're designing an anomaly for yourself, we recommend that you focus on a sort of four or five key aspects of how it's formed, how it's motivated, and how it operates in your world to give your agents and the investigation shape and substance. And the first thing is its focus. What is the thought or idea or circumstance that invited this anomaly and sort of has given it power? Is it the bitterness engendered by a thousand negative reviews about your copper? Mm -hmm. Or is it the pang of longing when you don't know whether your loved one has received your scarf? And they're out in the in the cold wilderness. So from there you have that, I think, is the core foundation of any triangle agency experience. But from there, we also ask people to choose an impulse, which is the way that it acts on that focus. Just literally, what is the verb that you associate with? Does it throw people into the moon? Does it consume people? Does it turn nearby X into Y? Does it turn all of the streets into water canals? Because somebody is fixated on their honeymoon in Venice. A third aspect of anomalies that we ask people to form is the anomalies domain. That is where it is most powerful. That is also, that tends to be where it forms. You know, if there is a memento or a piece of memorabilia, that might be like at the very heart, that might be the physical manifestation of this anomaly. And so that is the place to which agents will most likely have to go in order to neutralize it. A key part of domains is that the anomaly can eventually grow so powerful that it expands its domain. So that isn't typically represented by the anomaly itself, like growing in size. It's just like expanding the region in which it has near complete control over reality. And I can talk a little bit more about domains in a bit, but we also ask people to consider the history of the anomaly, what it has been getting up to, whether it's been slowly growing in power, what it's what the history of the person or people who have manifested this anomaly are, it ultimately turns into set dressing and sort of deeper lore that gives investigators the ability to, and field agents, the ability to sort of tease out and piece together the story so that they can learn more about the other elements, like its focus and its impulse. And finally, you also mentioned the appearance. Could be, does it appear as a mascot? Could it, does it appear as a human person? Does it appear as a, a paperclip or a coffee cup? So one of the difficulties that I frequently run into when I think about games of this type mm -hmm. is, uh, so there was an SCP 5E game that kind of came out. And one of the things about paranormal investigation is frequently there is an unusually specific set of procedures or methods of interface, which are safe. So for instance, within the video game control, there is a refrigerator that if it is not constantly looked at, will consume anyone nearby who looks away. And this is kind of a, a common theme. This is the movement mechanic in Slender Man and, and so on. This is something that is that has popped up before. And frequently within those media, the failure to obey whatever protocol it is to interface with this paranormal or occult or paranarrative item is somewhat lethal. Esoterrorists tries to answer this by having a pretty tight investigation system where you are badass and you say, I spend a point to figure out what the item wants. <laughs> and it just kind of, and it hands it to you, assuming it is within the narrative purview of what your character can do. So your character may have understanding of, of paranormal physics, another character may have understanding of deep lore and folklore, another character may understand uh, mundane sciences, and basically the role-playing experience is tracking down what the anomaly is, and then basically spending your Jason Bourne badass points to be a Jason Bourne badass albeit in the investigative sense, what are the mechanics for figuring out an item and also what tools are provided to a storyteller? Because frequently within, again, going back to the, the video game control, a lot of what these items do are elucidated by the fact that they're, the world is littered with in-game materials. There are hundreds of thousands of words scattered throughout the game. And quite simply, as a storyteller or a game master, as a general manager, I don't want to have to do that. <laughs> uh -huh. So there are kind of two answers to that. Uh, yeah. One is to have a mechanic for it and or provide a lot of information. Or another one is to just kind of skip that part 
and you have a relatively common set of tools. We have to deploy the ghost trap a la Ghostbusters, which collects the ghost energy and prevents the ghost from doing ghostly things. And we don't really care what its MO is. How do you solve that investigation portion of dealing with the paranormal? Answering in sort of reverse order to speak to the mechanics of the investigation, the tools that the agency gives you, I think are another point where we underline the agency's priorities, its attitude, how it wants you to perform your job. Every agent is sent into the field with a tool called the normal briefcase. Capital N, capital B, by the way. Capital N, normal, capital B briefcase, mm-hmm. which is a totally mundane looking, perfectly normal briefcase that you can use as sort of, you mentioned like a ghost trap. You know, imagine the Ghostbusters throwing the here I am not remembering the name of it. But I think it's that, literally called a ghost trap. A go- it is called a ghost trap. Okay. Yes. The normal briefcase. It's like that or, you know, uh, in your favorite monster catching game where you sort of where when you have either worn the anomaly down or even calmed it down or parlayed with it, you are able to open the briefcase and sort of contain the anomaly within the briefcase. It'll reshape to fit inside. The other tool that the agency gives you is called the ripple gun. And it is literally a 19, 1960s sci-fi gun that is devastating to anomalies, but perfectly safe for mundane targets, humans, animals, other things like that. And the agency gives you those two tools and it says, we really want you to can capture them so that we can study these anomalies and possibly turn them into, you know, profit. But at the very least, you must, if it comes to it, destroy them. Those are like the fundamental criteria that you're handed by the agency up at the top. Teasing out your questions about the investigation and how we help general managers Mm -hmm. help players sort of dig down into what could, in many games or at many tables, turn into a very frustrating sequence of, well, does this work? No. Well, yeah. does this work? Uh, no. To quote Robin Laws, a, a thrilling game of guess what the storyteller is thinking. Um, <laughs> right. Yeah. The Our way of handling that is, you mentioned one of the tools you might, an example of a tool you might give is more information. So our way of giving GMs the ability to transmit more information in a way that is supported by mechanics and in a way that is supported by the system is in our chaos effects system, the chaos effects in our game are a a table that GMs can use as chaos builds up in the game. And I'll go in a bit about how chaos is generated in the game, but the the general manager is slowly accruing these points of chaos and the chaos effects table gives them basically the opportunity to go shopping for different various effects. I'll read off a few of them now. They might include things like manifest, where the anomaly spawns a minor anomaly that is a physical expression of itself and its goals. And that alone is a huge tool that you can give to a GM. For a given anomaly, what does that minor anomaly look like? What does it sound like? How does it behave? If you try to talk to it, does it say anything? Those are all ways that you can, as a GM, drop clues, drop hints, underline things, drive players in the right direction to be like, oh, it seems to be really fixated on, you know, stealing all of our rings. What's going on with that? Another example might be just a more basic corrupt is a low level one of those where the anomaly changes reality in a mon- in a supernatural way. I mentioned like turning all of the roads into canals, like that might be an example of corrupting. But that, again, is for the GM to decide, how does this anomaly use corrupt? That alone, uh, any GM who's already done the prep work of figuring out the focus and the intent and the history will very likely have strong ideas about how to spend those chaos effects. And as a sort of last resort, we not necessarily a last resort, but I, I have used it as a last resort. There's a chaos effect called displace that essentially lets the anomaly sort of abscond with the players to a neutral ground, to like not the domain necessarily, but to an extra spatial place that can sort of be a negotiating table or an opportunity for the players to interview the anomaly or for the anomaly to send a message to the players. That can be really useful 
if you have done all your homework and you've given your players a lot and you feel like you've given your players a lot of clues, we also give you the tools that allow you to just let the anomaly walk up to your players and safely say, hey, this is what I'm about. Yeah. So so there's not per se a case where I roll anomalous investigation plus intelligence to <laughs> suss right. out, okay, as resonance, plural. I use my power. So for instance, I use my gateway power to try and hive off this entity, which in turn costs chaos, which is something the general manager can use to influence what the entity is capable of. This is an interesting case of kind of splitting the difference between a Uh, of operationalizing or making true to the in-world reality what is essentially an extra game resource. So like in a lot of games, you have an idea of a momentum and attention pool, where as characters do things, they build up momentum, they have the ability to spend it to get an in-game benefit, and that reverses itself. And if that goes too low or in exchange for certain abilities, the storyteller gets points in a attention pool or a complications pool. Here, the nature of chaos is such that, no, 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 this is an in-world mechanic. This is not a narrative abstraction. Is it also the case that individual entities, like if if there is to be something like a monster manual, book of anomalies that says, oh, also this particular one has the ability to spend four chaos to cause all forces in the area to fundamentally change. Light is now a fluid, and if you want to see anything when you turn on your flashlight, you have to spread the light out manually with your hand over the surface of it or something like that. Is that how it works, or is this chaos effect table just kind of cover everything? I want to say that's a brilliant visual, and I really appreciated uh, that living in that world for even a brief moment (laughs) where uh, light turns into a fluid. But at present, with the materials available in the Delta test, yes, the chaos effects table is all that we have. We also... As a note, though, to listeners, it is very broad... Yes. Um, it's <laughs> it's not one of those things where it, it's uh, we're talking about things like distort an object or location is changed and boy howdy is that easy to theme with your object the the, the shoot for the moon example is that mm-hmm. creature initially instantiated say in 1971 when the school underwent a new rebranding under its third headmaster in an attempt to allow it to compete more competently with its local day school rival or something like that and now throughout the area things are changing to their 1971 equivalents to that, which in some cases is useful and in other cases, not so much. It's like, oh, these walls are asbestos. Now, that's not great <laughs> or, or something like that. So these are very broad categories of effect. This is by no means a straight jacket compared to like the creature does 1d6 plus one damage. That actually dislodged a piece in my brain that made me realize I also want to talk about another mechanical tool that we give players and GMs to sort of aid the investigation, but more on the subject of you know, you you know, you mentioned sort of like a bestiary or a book of anomalies that says this one has this ability, this one can do this. Right now, listeners can find an adventure that we call One Night at the Shelterwood Inn, which is a crossover mission that we've made with liminal horror that is actually playable in both systems. In that, we introduce a type of minor anomaly that has an additional effect that you can spend on the chaos effects table. That is a very flexible way that GMs can homebrew ways to make their anomalies feel unique. And it also is a gesture towards the sort of elaboration that we're likely to see without spoiling too much in the larger game and also especially in the companion book that we're releasing as part of our Kickstarter campaign, The Vault, Missions for Triangle Agency. How has your experience as a professional GM, storyteller, what have you, influenced your design of the game? Every time I've been actively running a game that I love, even with, you know, people that I love and felt bored, that moment has turned into inspiration for this game. I would not say that there's any like one aha moment, but I think in aggregate, I've played enough games with enough people who like to use games like Dungeons and Dragons in wildly different ways. You might have somebody at the table and and this is this can be a result of, you know, needing to add people to the table at the last minute or even being assigned because, you know, you were hired by them and you had no say in who's at the table. And if you don't take the time or have the time to run a session 0 or go over those sort of pre-play campaigns or uh, campaign tools, you can end up with people at the table, one of whom 
only ever wants to talk to everything and wants to talk to every animal and every stone and every brick. And another player who wants to murder every person and every stone and every brick. And those two players are going to be at odds and it's going to be very, very difficult to tell a cohesive story with that group. How that has manifested in triangle agency is that the game system gives you a set of values and lets you interpret them the way that your table wants to. And it also introduces a rewards and punishment system for either adhering to or not adhering to the values. Is there any sort of mechanic where the table decides what kind of game it is? Like, for instance, a selection process whereby you determine this is the nature of the agency or what have you, um, kind of as a, a an, an assisted session zero. So session zero being the name for the set of technologies whereby before actually playing a table uh, or group of players kind of agrees, this is what's going to be in the game. This is what isn't going to be in the game. These are themes that we want to explore. These are things that just aren't going to happen in our game because I am personally uncomfortable with it or what have you. As time goes on, games have gotten better at kind of facilitating that process, either providing explicit safety tools or by saying, hey, here are some explicit questions you may want to consider. Does Triangle Agency do anything along those lines? I mentioned the reality component of your character. This is also an example of a way that players have shared agency over the type of story that they're going to tell. So when you're building your character in Triangle Agency, that reality component one of the three things that you pick when you're building a character asks you not only to consider whether you are, you know, an internationally famous superstar or the caretaker to some dependent or somebody who is uh, chronically falling in love with strangers. It also asks you for each of those, who are three important people in your life? If you're a star, who is your manager? Who knows you from before you were famous? Who is your rival? As in, in part of answering those questions, you either assign or work with the rest of the table to assign who at the table is going to portray those people. This is not a system where the GM runs every NPC. There are those key relationships that in total create a whole huge background cast of characters that can come in at any point and have a direct relationship with one or more of your players that are played by you and the other people at the table. And that is an enormous lever that we hand to players to sort of set the tone and to focus on what, you know, what the nature and the, and the character of this game is, of your play group is going to be. And that is something a, a number of games do. So Wraith the Oblivion, Another player at your table plays your dark side, and that has the benefit of lightening the load for the for the storyteller or person running the game so they're not perpetually in that space. Someone else has the ability to kind of push on that lever, and kind of when you introduce a mechanic like that, if a player says, well, I don't care, at that point, we're now talking about premise rejection, mm -hmm. and it's the equivalent of, of someone refusing the call to adventure, and the follow-up is, okay, please make a character that would then, otherwise we're not <laughs> actually playing this game. <laughs> well, also for, the, for this hypothetical player who... Like when presented by a character, like, you know, a family member of their character who comes to them and says, hey, I actually need your help with something. If they, you know, always rebuff that person and decide that it's not important part of their character, we hand a, a tool to game masters in that regard, because one of the chaos effects that the GM can use is called reality trigger. Every character has a built in hook that is related to their background that the GM can just spend a little bit of their currency to make happen then and there. And there is a mechanical drawback if the player then fails to answer that call to adventure. You might have a fan come up to you and ask for an autograph or ask for to talk to you about a piece of work that you did that was really influential to them. And if you just brush them off, then you just earned, you just sort of delegated that responsibility to your manager. And now your relationship with your manager has become worse, which has a mechanical impact on your character's development. One of the things that you've mentioned is you're a creature seemingly with with pretty potent powers uh, mm -hmm. reading through, for lack of a better term, what I'll call the playbooks, the kind of list of things, the the A you can be anomaly. Some of them are, are, are pretty interesting. But as you mentioned, one of your things is to cover up loose ends. Is there any self-censoring or antimimetic properties of anomalies? Because it seems like one of those things where a single YouTube video could kind of blow the lid on paranormal activity kind of being a thing out in the world. Or is it just kind of one of the nature of the world that people periodically see the truth and completely ignore it? I've always found where 
the credulity of the public in games of the supernatural and paranormal lies to be kind of highly informative of how parodic or satirical it is. Where does that lie in Triangle Agency? The frustratingly true answer is it depends on your table. But I think that examples that we've already got out there, one that I think hits me every time is actually in the video for our Kickstarter. I promise is worth the six minutes. It's essentially a short film, the incredible Shannon Stritchy uh, edited for us. That includes an example of the agency reaching out and sort of addressing directly a loose end. And it also includes an example of the ways in which it is interfered with and thwarted. When I run games, a tool that I've seen used incredibly well is something called the printing press release. So this is an example of a requisition, one of those magic items that you can buy from the agency. It is something that is given as a starting requisition to any player who starts as a with the competency public relations. It is a tool that you can use to write any article. And once you have written it, it will immediately be sent and published in every major publication. So that's an example of a tool that we give players to that's very open ended that could be a very potent tool to address things that might include catastrophic amounts of loose ends. You know, if there's a school bus floating in a city street, I had a game where there was a school bus floating in a city street. <laughs> One of my players was in public relations and they used the printing press release to announce that there was a famous magician in town who was doing mind freak style stunts and special effects. And that alone got them out of so much trouble. So it meant that things could be publicly floating in the middle of a town square and people would say like, oh yeah, that's just, you know, David Blaine doing his thing. So you kind of use the paranormal to fight the paranormal, a, a, a la the entirely the, the normal capital N, capital B briefcase. And I assume they're all 1971 swing line leatherette brown folios um, <laughs> <laughs> or something like that. Yes, that is the default model. However, it is most imperative that it's low key. So if for whatever reason you need to go, you need to like pull a gen 21 jump street, it might look like a backpack or a messenger bag. And, you know, that's something that we're still exploring. But for the most part, when you are agents, you know, dressed in your sunglasses and your suit jackets, it is absolutely that, that with the buckles and the gold lining. Yeah. Because the thing I always liked about that is like, hey, the new model's out and it is identical <laughs> physically to the previous one and and just people are like oh man i can feel it they've really they've done some <laughs> they've outdone themselves yes <laughs> and you're like this is literally to me it is important to draw the difference between satire parody and homage within mm. a game um it is very in my experience as someone running games farce is not a place you can come back from in a game so mm -hmm. anything that kind of advances down that track needs to be very strategically deployed <laughs> as it were so one of the things about uh we, we mentioned w one of the modern touchstones for paranormal investigation is scp special containment procedures which is a a wiki online project that talks about an agency that collects catalogs and controls paranormal, supernatural, or mysterious phenomenon or objects known as anomalies or SCPs. It is a shared universe. A lot of people write into it. One of the things that happens over time is the object or investigation kind of starts to be the focus, but as these worlds develop, and this is something that happened with the Southern Reach trilogy, best known for the, the original book Annihilation. What is that, Jeff Vandermeer? Followed by X-Files, a popular TV show in the 90s and early 2000s. It goes from the investigation to the investigator and the agency behind it. How deep is the lore about the agency? Is that something that you plan on building over time? Uh, because otherwise, something that you get to do as a designer is say, no, this isn't what this game is about. Or if you want it to be about this, do it on your own time. Come up with your own thing. Uh, share it on our Reddit or our Discord server. The short answer is we don't intend to be hands off with it. There is absolutely more lore to the backstory of the agency, to other voices inside the rulebook that we intend to build into as uh, rewards for character progression and for engaging with you know the story on its own terms. And a lot of that has to do with what opinions your table forms about these different voices, who they choose to trust, who they choose to invest in, because you might hear the same story told from two perspectives 
But you also might hear two completely different fabricated stories where the truth is sort of in the negative space between them. We definitely have an opinion about it, but it's something that uh, I think would harm the experience if we came out and just said, yes, this is the story you can read in the lore compendium. For a game like this, I appreciate the ambiguity of the phrase officially endorsed, um, uh-huh. as in officially endorsed by the authors or officially endorsed by the agency, because I, th- <laughs> I think we would all be interested in both yeah. of those. And you could certainly see the in-game artifact of this is the this is the line, this is the story, mm. and then you find the 10,000 exceptions to it, and then you have the anti-history, as it were, that, that sits alongside the history. But right. that is a direction that you want to go. Another thing that your game does that I almost consider to be bold is you are designing this game to be for medium lengths of play. I think it is listed mm-hmm. as 12 to 15 or 13 to 16 sessions. Yes. Why engineer a game for that length as opposed to the one shot or alternatively we are going to take our turd farmers all the way up to level 300 or something like that (laughs) two major reasons number one we talked about how caleb and i have really cut our teeth on just like you a number of different groups just running games and running games and having that experience of this shockingly small percentage of games that last longer than a medium length campaign and so we I think part of it is just accepting that lowercase r reality, you know, catering to what is visibly a not necessarily a need, but definitely, you know, an experience that people are accustomed to without that pressure to commit to something that could be an open ended commitment that you have for the next 30 years. That being said, once you're done with your campaign of Triangle Agency, that might not be the end of your campaign. That's just the end of your agent's career. And so you can have that agent. As, as your agent progresses, you're forced to make choices about how they spend their time. And how they spend their time, just like in the real world, closes doors. There is an opportunity cost every time that you level up, quote unquote. And, and that is something that is mechanized within the game? Absolutely. In, our, in the game, the system is called work-life balance. The way that you track your character's progression, the way that you sort of, there's this narrative idea of what your character is doing in between missions. And you do have to make mechanical choices about that. And they have outcomes that reflect themselves in how your powers expand, how your relationships expand, how your access within the agency expands. Another part of that is that, yes, because of the work-life balance system, your character must reach an end to their career, at which point they will either retire well they need to make a choice about their dis- their relationship to the agency do they retire do they get fired do they quit all of those things have direct narrative implications and are i would hope by the end of the campaign powerful emotional decisions that you have to make about this character that you have a long relationship with but that's not to say that you can't have characters retiring quitting and getting fired at different times and cycling in characters with different levels of seniority and having a campaign that does turn into one of those evergreen things that is a part of your life for for years or decades. And all of this makes sense. So Sean, this seems pretty fascinating. It really looks like you put your shoulder into it. There is a completely usable Delta document that is out that for the uh, whopping cost of $0, Uh people can see what it is. My three rules for Kickstarters nowadays are don't back anyone's first project, don't back anything that doesn't have a preview, um, and don't back anything that's going to be the first of a seven book series. You and your design team have done quite a number of things. This is actually the first Kickstarter from this uh, uh, directly from this company, but each of you have the bona fides of gaming qua gaming. Two, you're not billing this as the first of uh, of N, which I which I appreciate. If nothing ever comes out besides what is in this Kickstarter, your your fandom may be disappointed, but they will be they will be whole at least. And there is something you can play. I don't know if gorgeous is the word I would use, but it does a thing that games do now, where they really play with layout to convey the world of the game, which I certainly appreciate. If we were interested in backing this or finding out more, where can we do that? Yes, thank you. Our Kickstarter campaign is currently live, unless you are listening to this on or after July 6, 2023. You can find us at kickstarter.hauntedtable.games and learn more about the game and how you can back it and what sort of rewards you can receive. If you have already played the Delta Test and you want to see more material about you and your play group for things that you can use to inspire more play sessions. We have a stabilize all realities jam, 
which is a game jam where we've been creating crossover adventures with other creators, but we also invite people to come and create homebrew materials and to share things that have happened in their campaigns. That's visible from our itch page at hauntedtable.itch.io. We're also going to be having a campaign on the Blackwater D&D Twitch channel called The Right Angle. That's going to be on Wednesdays starting June 21st, where we're going to be playing another three episode arc of triangle agency yeah thank you and if we are interested in knowing what you're up to or possibly having you run a game of this for us as a paid storyteller where can we find out about that yes you can find us on twitter at haunted table you can find us on discord at discord.hauntedtable.games and if you are interested in having one of the designers run a game for you actually that is a kickstarter goal at one of our tiers you get the entire package of the core rule book the vault mission collection and any unlocked dice and other physical goals other than the ripple gun uh, and a session run by our lead designer caleb zane hewitt nice and links to all that will be in the show notes this game as more and more time goes on appears to be more homage than parody or satire to the paranormal genre when i look at this aesthetically it seems to pull off the game control it is less influenced by scp than i thought it would be where did you what do you consider to be the 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 major sources and inspirations and are there kind of any hidden ones in the sense that this actually drove my thinking even if it didn't appear in the aesthetics of the game you mentioned scp to a large extent, the Delta test, even though it's a you know a playable, immersive document that a lot of people have really resonated with, it's just the tip of the iceberg. And that's what you know the rest of my life is going to be for the next 12 months, is making sure that you know the rest of this game is like lives up to the massive expectations now that we've generated. But there's already a lot of content in this game that hasn't been released to the public, that isn't that we've sort of touched on and brushed past over the course of this conversation. But specifically, you mentioned SCP as an influence. And I think the place where people will find, will feel that most directly is in that system of requisitions that I was talking about, where over the course of your missions, the anomalies that you collect will be submitted to the agency for investigation or retrieval and might then be processed into magic items that you can use out in the field. And so the missions that you do might turn into sort of Here's an inspiration that I've never said until just now, a Mega Man style. I've beaten, I've defeated this monster and now I can use its powers to defeat other monsters. And so when I learn about, you know, a water monster that's terrorizing downtown, I might go into the requisitions bank and get an ice beam from the freezing anomaly that I just apprehended. Speaking more broadly about inspiration, I would say, you know, obviously control is up there. My elevator pitch for the game is imagine if the X-Men were working at the Severance offices and Severance being the the popular show on Apple TV where people are working in a openly hostile yet banal office uh, corporate environment. Does the triangle aesthetic come specifically from control or is that just a recurring theme in these kind of paranormal things? I know you frequently have references to the tip of the pyramid or the tip of the iceberg and so on. You have the bloody Caltrop design, which is what I'm referring to as your as your core dice. Control was a game put out by Rem Udi uh, Entertainment, which is very much within this paranormal investigation phenomenon. And it does throughout the game the thing where there are two dissonant voices that are talking to you. So, for instance, your character will be referred to as welcome, we are glad to have you as the new, and then in quotation marks or parens, it may say director slash interloper. So there is a kind of ambiguity that is maintained when this otherworldly entity communicates with you, uh, quite simply known as the board within the game. And that seems to be something that you have at least partially taken. Are these just tropes that are already out there or were they inspired by? Well, I mean, you called out the triangle as an example. And aside from the from the fact that it is part of the nature of physics, Using a triangle as a symbol is, you know, as old as recorded human history, I have to assume, you know, the Illuminati, Christianity, any number of institutions that have sort of zeroed in on that as a symbol. Culture is a conversation and everything I've ever done is going to be present in this game in some way. There is absolutely a recognition that those sorts of stories are something that people want to hear, where it sort of intersects with that very familiar level of, I'm working at a place that dehumanizes me, or I'm, I work with an organization, again, that is immoral or amoral and doesn't even know 
what my personal desires are or or could not even begin to process what it means for me to feel conflicted morally about something. All of that just drives into what to me I've kept hammering as something that is really key to what I hope players walk away with is their decisions, them making judgment calls about how their characters are operating, who they're going to believe, what their characters are going to value, and how they're going to spend their time, both with your friends at the table and also, again, in that work-life balance system, what they do in the off hours. And I totally agree that that culture is a conversation to attempt to own an idea or an aesthetic. Um, I think the term for that is being Disney. For people who are interested in kind of getting the theme in the mood, what are some lesser known places um, that they may want to look? I would say that we've been really, really fortunate in the realm of specifically actual plays and podcasts in that even before the Delta test started getting any amount of traction, everybody we reached out to that we wanted to work with said, yes, absolutely. This sounds like a blast. And so you can, there's a living record of that on our Kickstarter page and at hauntedtable.games, our home website of just us appearing with people like Plus One AXP, and I mentioned already Blackwater D&D, also Oddities Roadshow, people that we've worked with who we think, oh, so the Many Realms podcast, everybody. It's been such a delight working with these people whose work that we love, who have painlessly just gotten it. And the episodes that are available now to listen, I think are a really great example of the different types of stories that you can tell using Triangle Agency. The world of this kind of paranormal investigation has gone in a bunch of different directions. I think paranormal investigation has finally hit the point where it has the point option to go in the demythologized burlesque double down direction that happens to any fully developed genre and was probably first recognized with Westerns. And, and I appreciate that. And now we are finally getting games that deliver on the promises of all of those variants as odd as it sounds, RPGs are technology and technology advances over time. Um, and it's interesting to see someone lay down another brick in in what that could be as we figure out better ways to tell stories with people we care about that we will remember that matter. And I don't think we can ask for anything more as titter big players. So <laughs> that that is so kind of you to say. I'm genuinely getting a little emotional. I appreciate that. That's such an honor to hear. Yeah, culture is a conversation again, it, and and we're very happy to be a part of it, and we're happy that people are so interested in what we have to say. And with that, Sean, thank you so much for joining and describing what your game is. I hope it has all the success in the world, and you're able to deliver on your desires and promises in due time. As do I. Thank you so so much for having me. So, how do we magify this? The anomaly building system very much focuses on one-off strange entities and one-off strange creatures. And I really like this as an alternative to just using night folk antagonists that may already have a well thought out place in the universe and have a bunch of background and lore, a haunted snow globe, or a car that is formed from the memories of lost love at devil's peak or what have you, isn't going to have all of that baggage to it. So that may be useful in a game, especially if you're dealing with long timers who are kind of jaded. Uh, this helps create genuinely strange creatures and can help underline why the Union spends so much time trying to control the census. On the other side of the Ascension War, other factions may have more of a split decision. A hermetic chantry may have no issue with a manifestation called the Headmaster, a sentient embodiment of academic discipline made out of rulers in chalk that chides people who are lazy. This can give us a story as to what needs to be done to keep them in line or what happens when they grow too powerful. This is the anomalies. Maybe your group comes upon a chantry where the figure has grown too powerful and the mage is immortal there or under its tyrannical thumb of constant study. This could also provide guidelines for spirit effects like Awaken Ephemera and how they could be used in game. A Mind 1 Correspondence 3 Prime 2 Spirit 3 effect could create such an entity with a tie to an area and it wouldn't need additional quintessence to fuel it and the creator would kind of get to choose the emotional valence that went into it, although that would obviously change over time. I also like the idea introduced of the ripple gun in the normal briefcase. I very much like the dichotomy of going briefcase or gun or ripple or whatever you want to call it on a mission. This becomes kind of a symbol of how people respond to the strange out in the world with the briefcase being used to describe those who err towards understanding and 
the ripple gun being those who want to destroy something. Alternatively, this could also describe people who are maybe uh, greedy and want to harness these weird effects to personal gain, even if it risks the rest of their unit. Whereas those who go gun tend to make sure that everyone comes home because their goal is to just get in, destroy the problem, and get out with the minimum risk of life or limb. Maybe instead of every mission including a briefcase as a literal object, the term comes from the Agent's Briefcase, which was first issued in 1951 and is a four-point wonder that is Time Force Spirit for correspondence for object that suspends something in an extra temporal box for a bit. Likewise, the Ripple Gun could be a Forces Spirit correspondence entropy item that prevents non-awakened, non supernatural entities from being harmed with it so you can use it more freely in a public area although the looks probably don't help uh, the a of anomaly suggests a world where more people have kind of odd quirks to them i like the idea that many t1s in the technocracy even if not awakened have one or two things they can do without paradox that are special in invisible sun there's a class of mages called zealots who can do magic but have honed the usage to be one very specific case or type um, in Mage, this could be represented with merits or some very special dice pool tricks. Your T1 getaway driver has nine dice in their dexterity plus drive pool, but they get two extra dice in their maneuver pool for any vehicle that also gets the equivalent of a single roll on entropy two or three effect with an arete of four in each chase scene to do something cool. They additionally, uh, the driver may increase increase the structure or durability of anything they drive by one, and the max speed is increased by 30%, allowing them to safely handle a school bus as if it were a sedan. The demerit system is useful and provides something tangible that the degree system in Technocracy Reloaded really doesn't. This allows agents to always have access to certain options at a cost. For instance, if you want a game that's reasonably lethal, you could have each player have a number of backup clones that each can be activated for nine de demerits. Maybe at 30 de demerits, they are jumped down a rank or the quality of their clone is reduced. This could apply to other groups and may represent your tie to an umbral being that supports your group. A group dedicated to Adonis or Osiris may have a Lazarus chamber or a Phoenix engine to revive you, but doing so comes at a cost with their umbral connection. Demerits also mechanize how well or poorly you've done. For instance, each loose end, each person that has witnessed an outbreak that has not been convinced or cowed into silence, killed or sent into hiding, results in three demerits, which is a way of saying uh, you can use procedures, but you will need to deal with this. If it's 10 demerits for letting the reality deviant go away, but you could only stop it with vulgar procedures on a crowded bus, it may simply not be worth it to do the effect. This could also justify some stone-cold killing if your characters are on the edge. I like the war within the organization as there are two factions going on, but at a very basic level. We get this with the red and white monks in the Arcanum and the political factions within the technocracy, but what is presented here is much more insidious. There could be various factions in the Union that have woven their way into the indoctrinational material, or a character could receive requests from two superiors with seemingly reverse goals. The characters need to kind of figure out what's going on. This is something that can apply outside of the Union. You may get messages in a dream that seemingly have contradictory purposes to them, but so far, messages given to you in dreams have always resulted in something good happening. It could be that you are getting actions that you need to take from an umbral court or a set of spirits or from ancestors of some sort, and they may not always be on the same page, and you may just become a proxy in a war that you didn't know about. The chaos system has players feeding an anomaly as they use their powers. In a mage game, this could take on a few vantages. One could be that for each non-success you get on a magic roll, add a point to the anomaly pool. Once the pool gets to 20, the entity that you're challenging manifests a new ability, and maybe at 40, it simply flees. This does two things. One, it acts as a timer. Two, it encourages using abilities to reduce difficulty to slow the increase of the pool, as well as cutting down on magic, if that's something that you want to have happen in your game. Um, players may choose to simply roll smaller dice pools if they just need one success to do something. This means there may be a lot of trait plus trait to simplify magic rolls. There may be a lot of hypertech. There may be a lot of occult or investigation skills going into it. Uh, they may also be spending quintessence to reduce difficulty and kind of justifies why the technocracy doesn't take as many risks with these things compared to other people. Um, this may direct actions towards lower sphere levels, which would have lower difficulty or nudge things towards being 
being more coincidental. Uh, this system could be used in a lot of other ways. Uh, for instance, it could show the contrast when dealing with an entity as the unionists are very interested in minimizing this because they understand kind of how it works, whereas their traditionalist colleagues could be a bit more loosey-goosey. This chaos system could also apply to any investigation system, even outside the union, as well as for ghost hunters. This is a system that could kind of go anywhere the characters aren't welcome, per se. Maybe they have 30 points to figure out the motives of the Umbral Baron before the court shifts and they lose access to it. They may have 40 points to figure out the nature of the paradox realm they are before Farawadi comes to punish them. They may have 20 points to figure out how to fit into a uh, police department before someone points out that they just seemingly don't quite belong. This would be similar to the clock system that we talked about when we discussed Blades in the Dark and other Forts in the Dark games. I like the idea of there being kind of an up or out track. Uh, one thing we get in Mage is generally if you're a technocrat, you've cut almost all mortal ties. Um, and if you're a traditionalist or a craft member, your family may know and your community may know and both may actually expect magic of you. What if instead, uh, as you improve, um, you need to kind of gradually cut your connections to the mortal world? With each point of a rete or rank maybe, in your group, you have to let go of one class of mortal connections, but gain considerable power or access to considerable resources. You gain your fourth dot of rete, and you can access better sanctum and better research materials, but you need to stop talking to anyone outside of your immediate family who is not awakened. Um, if you want to get to that fifth dot, you need to fake your own death. Maybe for the third dot, you have to give up your social groups or your church or something similar. You can join the ephemeral council of the seasonal realms, but you need to relocate to them permanently. Uh, you can become a T5, but we need you to get rid of the last of your family pictures. Uh, I think this sets up impactful and important moments and is a good way of very literally showing the cost of power. Uh, I like the fact that the game gives kind of a more detailed requisition system. Uh, requisitions in Mage is a fraught system and requires the player already knowing what they want. Instead, it may be useful to have a few devices that always work. Um that are at the beck and call of the players at a cost. They may request it based on their background or how they did on the last mission. This could include the normal briefcases listed here, a kind of object prison. They may request the warden's cuffs, a pair of tower cuffs from 1879, which provide four dice of counter magic against night folk powers, or six if you get the accompanying leg irons. The ripple gun, as I mentioned, entropy spirit prime forces item that does no harm to a to mortals, but does quite a bit to ephemeral or awakened entities. Uh, the teleport spray cans, a pair of Mortine brand spray cans with silver color from 1961, where when both are sprayed, a temporary portal opens between the two locations for one hour. I like the idea that requisitioned items would always work successfully, and that's part of the reason why you would do it. You could have it cost demerits to rent them, or you could require kudos from the characters to uh, purchase them in future sessions. Um, I also like the threat and stability chart. Uh, minor anomalies are small weird things that break off from the big weird things, and threat and stability indicate how much harm they can do and how much harm they can take. The action economy in Mage makes it, to me, very hard for one creature to be kind of a fair fight against normal mages if everyone um, is going for death without the foe being either numerous or being able to kill players instantly. What do I mean by that? Um, how do I balance four sets of Arite 4 against one entity with Arite 6, where the one entity may be able to just flat out do a forces effect that kills one or multiple of the characters, but alternatively, the characters are going to get to roll four times for every time the entity act uh, gets to act. Minor anomalies spawn as you play and help square up the action economy and build up the enemy. Their powers will be a variant of what the greater one does, so if my group is chasing down a streetcar that is tearing up roads trying to extend its streetcar network, um, as we engage, it may spawn a ticket vestibule that compels local mortals to queue up, um, which causes the mortals to flock to the hazard and kind of muddle up the fight rather than flee. Uh, bits of drawn-up track may form a shield around it, or trash may coalesce into smaller trains that try and run the player over. Those were my immediate ideas, and uh, I thought otherwise, this is a game I look forward to uh, grabbing. I have backed it, but please look at the uh, links in the show notes. You can get a fair amount of material for free. And with that, 
This has been Mage the Podcast. We're given the choice between the normal briefcase and the ripple gun. We would totally choose the normal briefcase, mostly because our aim is absolutely terrible. This episode is made possible by Oracle Josh Hillerup of the field office near the Gatineau River, Oracle Pukaji of the field office near the Schuylkill River, Oracle Neil Patterson of the Why Not South Carolina office, Oracle Jay Widener of the OK Oklahoma field office, Oracle McHale, of the Random Lake Wisconsin Field Office, Oracle the Crew of Erebus of the Dinosaur Colorado Field Office, Oracle Sean Gallagher of the Normal Illinois Field Office, Oracle Ben Bendelow of the Hell Michigan Field Office, Oracle Buck Gregory of the Rough and Ready California Field Office, Oracle Christopher Phillips of the Peculiar Missouri Field Office, and Oracle Guy Conan Stewart of the Spartacus Iceland Field Office. Thank you. Also, I'd like to thank Archmasters Andrew Edelstein and Archmaster Brad of the Blue, Archmaster Bubba the Pale One, Archmaster Dan Svensson, Archmaster Derek Semsek, Archmaster Jason Vines, Archmaster Morgan Aron, Archmaster Nathan Weaver, and Archmaster Patrick McNamara, as well as Alex, Alexia, Anders S., Anand Paderfi, Berto, Blaze Hibbert, Blake Ryan, Brandon, Bryce Perry, Chris Blake, Sin Shotis, Daniel Cuppin, Daniel Scribner, Darren Hennessy, Dave Droy, Dennis Osborne, Eli Levenger, Eric Schwenk, Fragger Rock, George Laura, Henry Kraft, Ia Bolt, Jason Kennedy, Jason W. Briggs, Jay Gatsby, Jeff Bryn, Jenna F., John Magnuson, Jolyn Andes, Lols and Stuff, Joshua Heath, Kathleen Halperin, Chris Kinner, Leroy Bryce, Leslie Weatherstone, Matthew Proyle, Michael Creedle, Michael Parker, Nathan Weaver, Nibero, Nikita Klamanov, Oliver Schindler, Patrick Mulder, Rachel Grace, Ricardo, Richard Bat Brewster, Robart the Robot, Ryan Stray, Rob H., Ryan Kendi, Samuel Tobin, Schnabelta Krieger, Starfish, Stephen Carton, Thrice Great, Vincent Hamilton, William Connolly, William Martin, and Zach Rules. Our EP shout out this week is to Jay Gatsby, which gives me an excuse to mention that The Great Gatsby was like the 17th title that F. Scott Fitzgerald considered. Uh, he had difficulty choosing and entertained many choices before re- reluctantly deciding on The Great Gatsby at the recommendation of his editor. Title was inspired by Alan Fournier's Le Grand Milneuse. And uh, previously, the title had been Among the Ash Heaps and Millionaires, Tremolchio, Tremolchio and West Egg, On the Road to West Egg, Under the Red, White and Blue, The Gold Hatted Gatsby, and The High Bouncing Lover. This also lets me mention one of my favorite Hark of Vagrant comics, a webcomic by Kate Beaton, where Gatsby and Tom Buchanan are having a back and forth consisting of, Tom, you'll never be like us, Gatsby. We're old money. Gatsby. Well, how old? Tom. So old. Old as balls. Thanks, old sport. Rather listen on YouTube, search Mage the Podcast on YouTube to find our full library there. If you super like this episode or super didn't, drop us a line at magethepodcast at gmail.com or at Mage the Podcast on Twitter. We have a hop and Discord community at discord.me slash Mage the Podcast, and Mage the Podcast is also on Mastodon at dice.camp slash at Mage the Podcast. If you like us, please give us a review on the platform of your choosing or tell a friend about us. Also go to magethepodcast.com for show notes and all of our previous shows. Now go change reality. Bye. <laughs>